Good everybody. If I could have your attention at the front of the stage, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Oh, hi. Good morning, everybody. Much better. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Happy Friday and happy Spirit Day. My name is Mr. DeGeis, and I am the supervisor of instruction in charge of the social studies departments, the best departments in the entire building, without question. <laughs> I am also a former social studies teacher and a lifelong student of history. Today, we are here to honor a really important moment in human history. Today, January 27th, marks International Holocaust Memorial Day, a day where we recognize and commemorate one of the most tragic, heinous, and atrocious acts of inhumanity in history. Almost 85 years ago, this event claimed the lives of nearly six million Jews, two-thirds of its entire population, and one and a half million of those victims being children, and more than five million additional members of other persecuted groups. That's over 11 million people. These numbers are really hard to kind of wrap our heads around and comprehend. Uh, but I want to try and give you a little bit of perspective to understand the magnitude and scale and scope of these numbers. So just take a minute to imagine every single person in the state of New Jersey gone, and then add two million more to that number. That would be the scale of the damage done to the victims of the Holocaust. Imagine just about every child born in America over the last three years, no longer with us. That would be comparable to the numbers experienced during the Holocaust. These types of numbers, along with many other statistics and realities, are what make the Holocaust one of the most widely researched topics that continues to be a predominant source of study even to this day. Right now, we are still uncovering camps we are still finding remnants of mass burial sites where the Nazis conducted these death marches. There are still all of these relics of this moment in time that we have yet to uncover and fully understand just how much damage was done during the course of this event. I'll leave you with one more piece of information in the hopes of further piquing your interest in the subject matter. During the course of the Holocaust, how many camps do you think were built by the Nazis in an effort to achieve their final solution? Anybody want to take a guess, throw out a number for me? 137? That was very specific. I know. <laughs> okay. So we have 137. Anybody else want to take a guess? Please. How many? 471? Seven. Seven death camps. Okay. So, all good guesses. All right, all of you are closest without going over. <laughs> so, what if I told you that the number was over 44,000? Some of these camps, like Auschwitz, the most infamous and notorious Nazi camp, were half the size of New York City, 11 square miles. Some of these camps were no bigger than this auditorium, all aiming to serve some purpose to achieve what Adolf Hitler and the Nazis viewed as their final solution, to eradicate entire races and cultures and groups of human beings that are no different from you and I. Never before and never since has there been such a widespread state-sponsored and calculated efforts been undertaken to systematically engineer the genocide of entire races and groups and cultures. Just imagine the kind of manpower, the kind of resources, the kind of efforts that were put forth to try and create this kind of evil in the world. And we can only imagine if that was put towards good, what kind of positivity that would have produced for the world. It is why we are here today, to never forget, so that way we never repeat. We are honored and privileged to be joined today by Rachel McClinton, an actor for Living Voices, a performing arts company devoted to bringing history to life through a unique combination of archival film and performative storytelling. 
During the performance, please demonstrate your utmost respect by giving the performance your full and undivided attention, keeping your phones and laptops and devices away, removing your earbuds, remaining silent, and most importantly, using this experience as a learning opportunity. There will be time at the end of the performance to ask questions, which I sincerely hope that you will. Just a side note, if anybody is missing lunch during this performance, please know that you are given permission to attend 5A lunch today. So just wanted to let you know that you will not be missing lunch after this performance is completed. Should you wish to ask Rachel a question when the time comes, please simply raise your hands and I will walk around with a wireless microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please give a very warm bulldog welcome to Rachel McClinton. Thank you. Well, I really uh, do feel honored to share this program that means a lot to me on this day when the Holocaust is being remembered. And I guess because those numbers that he was just sharing are so huge, I don't know how to connect to them. Yeah, please. Sorry, really quickly. Oh. Uh, is there an Angelica Reyna in the auditorium? I just need to see you up front over here. Angelica Reyna? Okay. No Angelica? Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. We're good. So anyway, the focus of what I'm sharing will be on individuals, Anne, her friend, a family, <coughs> because like I said, the numbers, they become so impersonal. But when I look at your faces, you're not numbers. None of us are numbers. We're individuals, and that's why I'm going to take that perspective on this program. Now, Anne Frank herself may be someone you've heard of, and if you have, it's not a big deal, but she is well known for writing this diary. She wrote it during two years that she was in hiding from the Nazis, and I'm not gonna focus on those two years because Anne does. She's an excellent writer, and I encourage you, if you haven't read her diary, check it out. And she's going to express what's going on for her in her own words. But I will share what happens to her before and after. The way I do it is kind of different. It's a combination of theater and film. It's kind of like a movie and a play squished together. But before we get to that part, I think it's really good to have some perspective of what was going on, why was she in hiding, and how it affected her individually. Anne grew up in Amsterdam, but she was originally from Germany. And that yellow blob there is Germany. That red dot is where she was born, the city of Frankfurt. Her dad was an officer with the German army during the Great War, or as they called it then, the war to end all wars. Didn't really work out that way, because we call it World War I. And even though Anne's dad was an officer, a decorated veteran of the war, it doesn't protect the family from what was to come. In 1933, Anna's four years old and her entire family have to escape Germany as refugees. They had family in that country for over 500 years and now they were no longer safe. Germany has lost its democracy, it's a police state. The Nazis are in control and all other political parties are gone, imprisoned or dead. If you don't follow Hitler and the Nazis, you're not safe. And the Hit Hitler and the Nazis had a lot of reasons not to like you. If you didn't have the right skin color, the right ethnic background, the right racial background, the right religion, the right thoughts, you're not safe. Parents could have their kids arrested. Kids could have their parents arrested if they didn't think they were being 100% loyal to the Fuhrer. For Anne and her family, being Jewish, well, that puts them in the crosshairs under the Nazis, so they get out while they still can. It wasn't easy, but they get to Holland. Just cross the border, like from New York State to Canada, but for them, it was night and day. Once they get into Holland, their lives get back to normal. Yeah, Anne has to learn a new language and go to a new school, make new friends, but she loves Amsterdam. That's the apartment building she grew up in, the courtyard she played in. We really know the most about Anne from this diary. This was a birthday present from her dad for her 13th birthday. She even helped him pick out just the one she wanted. The original diary is a red plaid book, blank pages. In the beginning, Anne is just writing about what's going on. Writes about school, Boys, after school, boys, music, boys, movies, boys, sports, boys. There's a theme. <laughs> Her life is pretty good. She's popular, and things seem all right. But the world around her is not all right. When she began writing in this diary, World War II had begun. 
You see, what ended World War I, I could say, all right, do we have a couple hours? Let's talk about the Treaty of Versailles. We don't. So, Treaty of Versailles ends World War I and has a lot in it, basically causes Germany's economy to tank, and Germany's not allowed to build another army. Hitler gets into power, says forget that, and builds the most powerful army the world has ever seen. He starts invading. So quickly, they invent a new word, blitzkrieg, lightning strike. Holland falls to Nazi occupation in five days. And now Anne is not only again in danger from the Nazis, there's nowhere to escape to. Her country's occupied, and basically the continent's occupied, if you don't count Switzerland. Neutral. So, they're trapped. And one of the first things the Nazis do when they take over, they label you. You don't know what people think, what people believe, what their religion is, maybe even what their racial background is, unless you specifically label them. And that's what the Nazis did. In every occupied territory, you had to go to a police station, register, and then they knew your name, your address, your race, your religion, and your politics. Anna to wear a badge just like that one, that big yellow Star of David on the top that says Jewish and Dutch, one in French, one in German. And he had to sew the badges on. He couldn't pin or tape it on. And the Nazis are sticklers for detail. So they even told you where to put it. Does anybody have a guess just by looking and thinking about it? Do you know where they made you wear the badges? And we know it was one particular spot. The white badge was a sleeve, and that was for Jewish people who were put in walled sections of cities where they were separated and then basically liquidated, taken to death camps directly. But in Amsterdam, they wore the yellow badge. Did anybody have a guess where that was worn? Or just shout out? Yeah. I mean, over your heart, like a target. You walked out your front door, they saw that yellow badge, they could call you names, they could beat you up, kick you out of school, or fire you from your job. That was your walking label. But you see there's other badges on there, other shapes and sizes. A lot of people were hated by the Nazis and other people were also wearing badges. Purple triangles were worn by Jehovah Witnesses. They were hated for their religion because they wouldn't fight for Hitler. They're pacifists, so they were persecuted. Black triangles for the Roma people. The Nazis used the derogatory term gypsies. They had no country to call their own. Like Jewish people, they were vulnerable. And all Roma people and all Jewish people are marked for total extermination under Hitler's final solution. Over 500,000 Romas are murdered just for their heritage. Pink triangle for homosexuals, you didn't have to be one, just being accused of being one. Red triangles, the antisocial. That's anybody who resists the Nazis. Maybe you're a teacher not teaching Nazi-approved curriculum. Maybe you're fighting back. Maybe you're listening to the wrong music. Did you know jazz and swing was considered degenerate? And if you listened to it, you could be arrested. I think the most interesting one, though, is the green one. That green triangle, preventative arrest badge. It means you haven't done anything wrong, but you might. You are a potential criminal. So anybody at any time could be arrested. And in a police state, you have no civil rights. You have no rights, so nobody is safe. But for Anne, wearing that yellow badge means she's marked the moment she walks out her front door. Curfew at 8 o'clock. Has to hand in her bicycle because Jews weren't allowed to ride bicycles anymore. That's a drag. Biking is the main way you get around Amsterdam. It still is. No more movies. No more sports. But what affects the family most directly? Anne's older sister, Margot, is arrested. She gets an arrest warrant like this. This is an arrest warrant in German. Hers would have been in Dutch. You didn't want to get one of these in any language. All 16-year-olds, they often identified certain groups in a city to identify, take them out bit by bit, take people out. 16-year-olds who are Jewish were being separated and arrested and taken. Anne's sister, Margot, is 16. She has three days to pack a suitcase and go to a train station to be taken to labor camp. They weren't told where you were going to go. You weren't told what was going to happen, but you were told what to pack. The Nazis provided very helpful details. They said, men, bring a nice suit. Women, a party dress. There will be social activities and dances where you're going. Pack accordingly. On that line above the photo says three pairs of underwear in German. No more, no less. They wanted you to pack what you're told, do what you're told, and do not question authority. Anne's dad questions authority. He is not going to let his daughter go, but if he doesn't send her, the whole family is going to be arrested for breaking the law. And remember, they can't just get up and cross a border. Borders are shut. If they make a run for it, they could be shot. The Frank family had one chance for survival, and they take it the day after Margot is arrested. It's not a trick question. I mentioned it earlier. But what did they do? What did they do the very next day so they could try to get away or be okay? That's right. And it's not just that they went into hiding, but I really appreciate you got that. It's when, the next day. They had a hiding place ready. 
You see, when the city fell to occupation, Mr. Frank immediately started looking for a hiding place. I can tell you for a fact, I don't have a hiding place that's ready to go. I have a teenage son, a cat, my husband, oh, and a gecko. You know, I just don't have this hiding place ready, but Mr. Frank did. Because months earlier, he knew they were in danger. He started looking for a hiding place, and there's this attic above the warehouse of his own office building that was perfect. No one knew it was there, really. He brought furniture and supplies and prepared it. So when his daughter was arrested, they went into hiding the very next day. They left a note on their kitchen table telling neighbors they had gone to Switzerland. And they left another note in their refrigerator with some cat food asking someone to please take their cat. They couldn't take it with them. And they disappear down this block. The hiding place of the building is on that block. You can see the buildings are close to one another. No alleys. That's good. Blackout curtains in the window so no one can peek in and see you. But during the work day, there were people below. So your life has changed forever once you're in hiding. And how long are you going to be there? I don't know. Days, weeks, months, years. If you're going to make it in hiding, you need people to help you, right? But who you get to help you is crucial. The Nazi paid people money to rat out people in hiding. And if you were brave enough to hide someone, it wasn't just your life on the line. If you were caught, you not only faced torture and death, but your family did as well. There were four people who were that brave and trusted, two women and two men. They worked with Mr. Frank, and they kept the secret. They also had to be clever. They had to cover the only door that led to the attic so no one else knew what was going on. Anybody have an idea how they covered that door or hid it from everyone else? What did they do? That's right. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is the actual bookshelf that was constructed to cover the one door. It was fake, but it looked real, and it was on hinges. When everyone left at the end of the workday, only the four helpers, they pulled back that fake bookshelf and they brought Anne and the others their supplies. So we're in this great open auditorium. It's a beautiful space. Now let's think smaller. Think of your classroom. Smaller, maybe. Ceilings low. Tiny spaces in hiding. Eight people. Anne's family is joined by another family. Anne names them the Van Dans in, their di in her diary. She changes names to protect people's identity from the Nazis. And they do have a son named Peter, who's Margot's age, and they're joined by dentist Anne names Mr. Dussel. Again, a fake name. Now, during the day, since there are people below, Anne and the others couldn't walk around. They couldn't talk above a whisper. They couldn't run water or flush a toilet. Windows were covered with blackout curtains, so that only meant not only people didn't see them, there was no light. But Anne and Margot and Peter still had schoolwork to do every day. They did homework by candlelight. There was one room in the attic separate from the others, and it had a skylight. And that one room is where Anne and Margot and Peter liked to go whenever they could. Number one, one place they got away from grown-ups. Also, that skylight. From that skylight, Anne could see one tree branch. And she used to write, this tree branch is all of nature to me. I'm watching the changing of seasons just from a tree. Anne was 13 when she went into hiding. She was there for two years. It was during that time, I think this diary and writing in it is what kept her from going crazy from boredom. This was her connection. She invented a name of a best friend, and basically she said, this is the only place I can tell what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. And yeah, she's detailed. It's personal. She writes about falling in love with Peter, arguments with her mom. There's some doozies. But she also wants to be a reporter. And Anne writes with such vivid detail that if you read the diary, you feel like you're in hiding with her, and she's talking directly to you. You'll also notice the diary ends in August of 1944. The family is discovered by the Nazis and arrested. Anne's writing stops. Her experiences don't stop there, so that's what I want to share with you guys now, what happens to Anne before and after she's in hiding. And like I said, it is kind of different. I'm going to share it from a perspective of a friend of Anne's, the film that goes along, there'll be voices in it, and I'm going to talk with those voices like they're people right here with us. They'll be very real for me, but in a way, we're going on this journey together, so I hope they become real for you, too. The last group, because this program is not long, it's just under a half hour, we had time for questions. It's something I look forward to most of all. So when you're watching this, if there's things, not even that, that you don't get, but just things you want to remark on, things you want to explore, remember it. We'll have time to talk after. So keeping that all in mind, I want to thank the theater here for having the program. We're going to transition now to the film, and I'll talk to you guys after. So thanks.
yesterday and today speak for themselves. It is a call to war. Does anyone pretend this nation will remain a neutral nation? It's worse than the flesh. Get it started. Get it started. It's fighting and it's fighting. It's fighting terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way. To try to ensure peace. Of our home. A date which will live in infamy. And that consequently, this country is at war with terror. We will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Imagine you're given your best friend's diary. Anna Frank is my best friend. This is her diary. Sarah, guess what Father gave me for my birthday? You'll never guess. It's something I wanted more than anything. He gave me my first diary. Anna wrote in this diary every day, but she never showed it to anyone. She took her writing very seriously. I know it would make Anna proud to have her diary published. Being a real writer is what Anna always wanted, you know? Well, my name is Sarah Weiss. Like Anna, I was born in Germany, though we didn't know each other till our families escaped to Holland got out just in time. With Hitler in power, Germany became very dangerous. The Nazis take over my country. Hitler believes in racial purity, blames people he hates for all of Germany's problems. Shops and people's homes are vandalized. The University of Berlin holds a book burning. A third of books from libraries all over the country are burnt. My, my father's a history teacher. To him, burning books is an outrage. Then one night, my brother Matthew, he was attacked by a gang of Hitler youth. After that, my family escaped to Holland. It will be all right. Yes, Mother? We'll be safe in Holland. I still remember the first day I meet Anna. When school begins, I haven't learned to speak Dutch. How would I make friends where no one can understand me? Why, we have another new student from Germany right over here. The teacher calls to a dark-haired girl. She's wearing a white dress. Hi. I'll help you learn Dutch. You will? It's not so hard at all. Well, from then on, Anna and I were inseparable. We live on the same block. Every day we play in this huge courtyard where we ride our bikes around the neighborhood. We spend holidays together. On special occasions like New Year's Eve, our parents let us have slumber parties. Oh, in the summer, I used to always go to the ocean with Anna and her older sister, Margot. Anna and I were always getting into trouble. We loved to play practical jokes on people. Our favorite, we used to throw water out of the window onto people below us. We're very good at it and we never get caught. And we have a huge collection of pictures of American movie stars. We go to the movies every weekend. Sometimes Anna said she wanted to be a movie star, like Catherine Hepburn in the Philadelphia story. <laughs> but mostly, Anna wants to be a writer. I love drawing just as much. We dream of being famous. We even start our own book. Anna writes stories. I illustrate them. When our book is finished, we're going to send it out to be published. But things are changing all around us. My parents tell me about Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, the shattered windows from Jewish homes and stores. I hear broken glass covers the streets of Germany. Over a thousand synagogues are burnt down. Then in 1939, Hitler's armies invade Poland. War is declared. On May 10, 1940, the Nazis invade Holland. The Dutch fight back. They open the water of all the canals. Water floods the countryside. Still, Nazis come closer. Paratroopers and soldiers force their way in. Five days later, Holland surrenders. The Nazis take over Amsterdam and order us to go about business as usual. How can we? Every week, Nazi restrictions are posted. Jews may not take part in public sports. What? Jews must hand in their bicycles. Jews are forbidden to visit I'll read cinemas. this one. Jews must be indoors by 8 o'clock every night. Jews may not visit Christians. Jews must wear a yellow star. What are supposed to do with all these rules? Read this one. Now even going to the beach is against the law. We can still sunbathe in the courtyard. And the Nazis restrict us from sitting outside in our own backyards. We have to sunbathe in secret on our roof. Listening to the radio is also forbidden. How could we give up the radio? BBC in England plays the latest music. We don't want to fall behind the times. 
want to go see who's at the Delphi? Oh, no, where else can we go but the Delphi? All the other clubs are restricted. Well, at least we know where all the cute boys are then. <laughs> Yes. Does my hair look all right? Anna, your hair looks perfect, of course. But don't you wish we didn't have to wear this yellow badge? I hate it. I hate it, too. You just have to pretend it isn't there. How? Come on, let's go before Mother gets home. Right. On rainy days, we go to Mr. Frank's office. It's safe there. We sneak up these long, narrow stairs to an attic where a skylight overlooks the whole city. Anna and I, we go in different rooms. We phone each other for hours. <clears throat> Hello. Petka, how may I help you? Oh, uh, yes. Is Mr. Frank there, please? I'm sorry, he's not available at the moment. May I take a message? Would you tell him that Harry Goldberg called in reference to his beautiful daughter, Anna? Sarah, stop! <laughs> Anna, you know he has a crush on you. I know. He walked me home every day this week. He, did? he carried my books, too. He didn't tell me. Do you think Father will like him? Well, of course, your father will like him. Why wouldn't he? Girls. Hello? Do you think we might be able to use these lines for business now? Oh! Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Frank. Sorry, Father. Well, that fall, the Nazis order us to go to a Jewish school. It's all right, Anna and I, we sit next to each other in class, so we're always in trouble for talking too much. But of that year, a lot of kids disappear. Every week, it seems like someone's gone. Yesterday, Margot and I were walking home, and we saw soldiers take away a boy she knows. Well, why did the Nazis do that? What happened? He had just put a jacket over his arm. Yeah? They took him because they couldn't see his star. What? Anna, what did you do for him? What could we do? Nothing. Then one day, right in the middle of my history class, my teacher began to cry. Forgive me, class. What's wrong with her? Last night, they took my husband away. I tried to imagine coming home from school that day and finding my own family taken. The next day at school, our teacher's gone. A few days after graduation, a Nazi delivers a warrant for my brother. Matthew was ordered to go to a work camp in three days? He's only 16. I, I didn't know that my family had a plan. Matthew, what's Sarah, happening? Sarah, we're separating. Separating? I'm leaving early tomorrow, but and the rest of you must go before they try to arrest you. I'm to go into hiding. Alone. My parents won't tell me where any of the hiding places are. They say it's safer that way. I feel sick as I watch my brother. Matthew gets away in the early morning. Now my parents say you must spend the day as normally as possible. I don't know what to do. I go right to Anna's apartment. No one answers my knocking. If only Anna's neighbor answers her door. What are you doing here? I, what do you want? I'm looking for Anna. Do you know where she is? Don't you know the Frank family has gone to Switzerland? No. You must leave here now. Switzerland! How could Anna leave the country without telling me? There's no time to think of any of it. The next morning, I say goodbye to my parents. We're all brought to different hiding places by the Dutch underground. I'm brought to this dark basement run by a Christian couple. I, I never know their real names. It's, it's a basement of a clock store. Everyone calls each other Schmidt. That's a code name. That's safer. And Mr. Schmidt builds a fake wall along one side of the basement. The Nazis make frequent raids. I huddle in the dark, listening to Nazis pound on that wall. Mr. Schmidt only comes down to bring supplies. My only companion is a radio. It's hidden in a book so Nazis won't find it. I spend an old day's drawing. I draw anything to remind myself of the outside. I pretend Anna's with me telling stories. I know Anna's safe with her family in Switzerland, but I hope Anna is thinking about me. And one day, Mr. Schmidt comes out to talk to me. I've been hiding in that basement for almost one year. Thank you. Sarah, there's a Christian family in Sweden who would like to adopt you. What? We'll have to smuggle you out tonight. No, wait. Uh, adopt me? What's happened to my parents? I don't understand. This is a chance for you, Sarah. How? You'd have new parents. New parents? We have no idea what might happen to you here. To any of us. What are you saying? This could be a new life. Wouldn't have done to get out of that dark basement and be safe again. But desert my parents, I can't do that. Life on the outside is getting worse. The underground, they have to bring in two other people to join me. It is really crowded now, but I am grateful for company. Eva and Max tell me about children begging right outside the window and constant raids. They say the streets now are empty except for Nazi soldiers and tanks. The silence is awful, and suddenly sirens and bombs exploding. We ought to have faith in the Americans. Listening to General Eisenhower on D-Day, we know the war will be over any moment. There, that's the station. Hold it there. Made this morning on the coast of France, in by France. troops of the Allied Expeditionary. 
One day the Nazis find our hiding place and tear right through the wall. I'm shoved like a criminal outside. The bright sun blames me. I've been in that basement over two years. People in the street pretend not to see us. They have to see. We march right to police headquarters, jails overflowing, even Max are taken to another cell. Last time I ever see them, their rumors, we're all gonna be sent to Vesterbork. I hear that's a prison in the country. The next day we're all marched to a train station. Vesterbork, it's a barren, lifeless camp. Hot wind blows sand and flies swirling all around me. My group is interrogated by the Nazis, one by one. Do you have any money? Any jewelry? No. Where have you been hiding? I, There's your No, I, I, I don't have anything. Please, I don't even know anything. If you let you me explain- You have violated German law. You are here to be punished. The Nazis make me wear blue overalls. Well, the criminals have to wear them. We're marched to punishment barracks. Other prisoners are running at us. They're looking for relatives or news. Sarah? Anna? Sarah, Anna. I can't believe you're here. Anna, what are you doing here? I thought you escaped to Switzerland. What happened to you? We never went anywhere. What? We hid at my father's office. You're in Where hiding. Where's your family? Anna, I don't know. My whole family went into hiding separately. I haven't seen or heard from my parents in over two years. I'm sorry, Sarah. Anna and I were ordered to work. Ten hours every day, we had to take apart old batteries. The acid burns my hands, the dust makes me cough. But Anna and I, we can talk while we work. Sarah, shh. Wouldn't the others laugh at us in these awful overalls? Anna, when the war's over, well, lots of new clothes. Of course, Peter thinks I look fine. Peter was Anna's boyfriend. They were in hiding together, and they'd go for long walks every night in the camps. I have to admit I was jealous. I wished I had a boyfriend like Peter, too. Every week, people were selected to leave Vesterbork. They were going to camps in the east, places we heard rumored were death camps. One Sunday, our names are on the list. We're going to a camp called Auschwitz. Sarah, stay with us. Yeah. Father says we must all stick together. Anna, I'll always stay close to you and your family. They say the Allies are in Paris already. Paris? Maybe they'll bomb the train tracks and save us. We're marched to long trains. Cattle cars. My cattle were shoved in. 60, 70, 80 people stay close to Anna. D don't get separated. There's no room to move. There's no room to breathe. Only one tiny window with bars. The door slams shut, bolted from the outside. It's dark. I can't see Anna. We're moving. And when the train moves, there's some air. When the train stops, it's unbearable. The heat, the smells. Days pass. I hear Peter. He looks out the window. He calls out the names of towns he sees. Night turns into day. You have no idea how long this has been. How much longer will it be? People are dying. Dead bodies, their faces smudged with footprints. When will this stop? Right! Connors, I'm gonna blame you, right? Where are we? Men in prison uniforms, pull us out of the car. Anna? If you are healthy, walk. What? If you want to stay alive, walk. Yes. Stay right. right. Go right. Left means death. Walk. Faster, stay close to Anna. Go left. Go right. Anna, don't go left. Left means death. We go right. We stay together. Men are being separated. Peter and Mr. Frank are gone. Anna, where are the Nazis taking all the men? Father. Peter. Anna, stay in our line. I see a black flame rising in the distance. There's an oily smell of death. Ausziehen! Undress? No! No, please, the Nazis stand and stare. I drop my clothes in a pile. A, a woman grabs my arm, stabs numbers in with a needle. Tattooed. A permanent mark. Hands in my mouth searching gold. Some of fillings I've neither not in my hair. I was there too. I was beautiful hair on the floor with mine. Too many bodies shove under one cold shower. They throw clothes at us, mismatched shoes, a pajama top. Nothing fits. You take what you get. At night, we sleep in barracks, tend to a bunk like spoons. We're hungry, but the Nazis give us nothing. In the morning, roll call. I, we stand roll call for I, hours. I, Sometimes yeah, somebody falls three, over, six, dies. Seven, then the roll call five. begins all over again. After roll call, we work. Arbeid macht frei. Work makes you free. 
Yeah, that's a Nazi motto. It's a cruel joke. Ann and I are lucky we work on a sorting detail. There's piles like mountains of shoes and babies, toys, uh, eyeglasses. These things belong to somebody. Where are the people now? Donetsk. We count and sort and still there's more. One day, I see a group of men. They pass on the other side of an electric barbed wire fence. Anna, Sarah, is that you? Mr. Frank, Anna! Thank God you're alive. Anna, don't Where cry. Where are Mother and Margot? Don't cry. It's your father. It's all right, Anna. I'll try to come back tomorrow. Can you be here too? Anna, quickly, before the Nazis see us, keep working. I will. I'll quickly! I'll Margot and Mother too. But Anna's father doesn't come back to that fence the next day. Or the day after. Where has he gone? What's happened to him? Anna, your father's working somewhere else. At least you know he's alive now. But I don't. Not anymore. Why? But they saw him talking to us. It's true. Anna's father could be dead. From one day to the next, any of us could be dead. You can't think about that. We have to help each other. Anything to survive another day. Anything to make it till tomorrow. Anna gets this terrible rash called scabies. Scabies are everywhere in Auschwitz. Anna, they don't. Sarah, I can't stand this itching. Anna, you can't think about it. You know scratching makes scabies worse. What if they call a selection? I'll never make it looking like You'll make it. Anna, look, look. I found charcoal. Tell me a story. I'll draw it right here. Tell me about Holland. You remember the one about the windmills? Girls, what? quickly. We must go outside. Yes, Mrs. Frank. Another selection for transport is being made. Frank! Anna! Frank! Margot! Anna, Yellow. Margot and I are chosen. Anna's mother has passed over. Her mother has to stay behind. Mother, please, we can't go without Anna, you. quickly. The train is leaving. You have to say goodbye now. Girls, yes. take care of each other. Another train car. This time freezing cold. Anna and Margot can't stop crying. They miss their mother. Hold on, Anna. The Americans are getting closer. They will free us. We arrive at a station and we walk for miles in the rain to a camp called Bergen Belsen. We walk through towns. Does anyone see us? Anyone care? Birds are singing in the trees. If only we could fly away too. Bergen Belsen is a camp not planned for so many. Nazis set up tents. During the first night, there's a terrible storm. The tents collapse on us. It's like a shipwreck. There's bodies and piles of wreckage in a cold sea of mud. I can't find Anna. Uh, I'm brought to barracks on one side of the camp. The camp is separated with two barbed wire fences now stuffed with straw. It is forbidden to make contact with the other side. Still after dark, many of us go to that fence. We call out the names of our friends or families. Look at the Frank sisters. Has anyone Sarah? else? Is that really you? Anna! I'm so glad to hear your voice again. How are you? How is Margot? Margot is sick. There's nothing to eat. We're cold. I don't know what to do. Anna, can you come back to the fence tomorrow? I'll bring food and clothes for you. Yes, Sarah. I'll be the here. The Red Cross have brought packages to my side of the camp. I collect what I can. I throw a package to Anna. Anna! The woman next to me got it, and now she's run away. I have to organize another package and go back to that fence. This time, Anna gets it. Sarah? Yeah? I don't have any tears left. What? I haven't had tears in such a long time. Anna, let's keep meeting at the fence, all right? I'll throw more when I can. Anna? Sarah? Yeah? I don't know how to thank you. But Anna doesn't come back to the fence. I'm worried diseases like typhus are everywhere in Bergen-Belsen. Then I meet a Jewish nurse who helps the prisoners. She knows Anna and Margot. The Frank sisters? Yeah. Yes, I've seen them. How are they? They have typhus. They're both very weak. Please, smuggle on my charcoal. Anything to write with. I know writing will help her. I'll see what I can do. Then one day in March, Margot was so weak from typhus, she fell off her top bunk. The floor was cement. Margot died. Sarah, I'm here about Anna. What is it? How is Anna doing now? She threw away all her clothes. Why? She said she couldn't stand the lice and fleas anymore. I brought her a blanket. You told me Anna is writing a story. Is she still writing? Did you find out what her story is about? I couldn't, Sarah. Why? I'm sorry. 
What? Anna's gone. No. Sarah, remember me. When you think of me, I'll never be gone. Our friendship will always be alive. Suddenly there's silence. Then they're here. Our liberators are finally free. The British soldiers are so kind. I can hardly believe men in uniforms could be so gentle. They give me everything I need. I survived. I can't think of anything beyond that. To stretch and feel your body, your face turn to the sun, to be free. But it's not over. First, there's a long trip back to Holland. At a hospital in Amsterdam, I receive a visitor. Sarah, I saw your name on the Red Cross list. Mr. Frank. Oh, oh, Mr. Frank, do you know about... You don't about have to say it, Sarah. I already know. I'm sorry. But I have some news for you. Yeah? Your brother is alive. Matthew survived the camps. Now we're the only ones left. We know he can't stay in Holland anymore. There are too many memories, too much destruction. Mr. Frank arranges papers for us to immigrate here to America. I start a new life here. My boyfriend David is an artist. David's helped me find the courage to draw again. I draw the past. First, I wanted to block it out, to forget it. I can't. A movement or a smell, and I'm right back where I was. Drawing makes me think of Anna. Why am I alive when Anna's dead? What would she be doing? Where would Anna be right now? And I think of my parents. I'll never see them again. And today, Mr. Frank, he sent a book for me to illustrate. He sent me Anna's diary. It made me realize we the living are not the only survivors. Anna is a survivor through her words. I live so I must remember. I share my memories through my drawings. So no one will ever forget. Through her diary, Anna's here. And she shares her memories too. P.S. I hope we'll always stay best friends until we meet again. I'll always miss you, Anna. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is kind of a transition of bringing up some light slowly, not shockingly. And I want to thank you guys. And we're also going to switch bit by bit to some PowerPoint slides I want to share with you guys. But in this time, I wanted to let you know how we know who Anne is today. Anne died of a disease called typhus. It's still in the world. And she died one month before her camp was liberated. She was 15. That film footage you guys saw of Bergen-Belsen, that's all that's left that documents that camp's existence. It's gone now. When British soldiers liberated the camp, they had to put everyone who died, including Anne and Margot, in a mass grave and burn the camp to stop diseases from spreading. So the only way we know who Anne is, is from her diary and this woman who found it. Her name is Meep Geese. Meep was one of the heroes who protected the family, and she was the first person to go into the attic when the coast was clear after the Nazis took Anne. She found Anne's diary on the floor. She put them in order and locked them in her desk drawer. She wanted to return it directly to Anne. Only Anne's dad, Mr. Frank, survived of the eight people that were in the hiding place. And Anne's dad was the oldest person in hiding. I would have guessed one of the young people would have made it too. Mr. Frank survived Auschwitz. And when he returned to Amsterdam, he actually moved in with Meep and Meep's husband. They became his family. It took him months to find out what had happened to his wives and daughter. I mean, daughters and wife. One wife, sorry. The nurse you heard in the piece, she was the one who wrote to Mr. Frank and let him know she was with his daughters in Bergen-Belsen. And only then did Meep give Mr. Frank the diary to read. He thought it was so good that he shared it with friends. And they all agreed this should be published. But that's a hard decision. If any of you all are keeping your own writing, journal entries, diaries, artwork, music, and if it's yours, you might not want your family members to read it, look at it, and publish it without your permission. But Mr. Frank also knew how much his daughter wanted to be a writer who shared her ideas. So he had it published. It was published in America in 1947 with an introduction by Eleanor Roosevelt. And 
It's actually today considered to be one of the most published books in the world, right up there with the Bible and Harry Potter. So it's easy to find. But just like your teacher was saying, the numbers are so huge. So I didn't focus on numbers. I focused on one friendship. But you guys know this is part of something much, much bigger. And the only way to figure that out or understand it is to ask questions, is to see what light we can shine. So that's what I'd like to do now. In a way, it's what I look forward to most of all. I don't want to lecture, even though I have a lot of cool stuff I can share. I want to see what kind of questions you guys have. The last group had excellent questions, and we just kind of followed their path. So I know there's a mic in the audience to make it easier so no one has to feel like they have to shout. And I also know it's weird being in a big space. I kind of wish to say, can we all just transport into your classroom so we can feel really casual about talking, but we're in a big space. 